Good morning. Is the mic on? Is the mic on? Hello, mic. Uh, Jack's miking me up. Hello, hello. Okay. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to St. Paul's. It's a delight to be together once again to worship the Lord uh, together. Just a few announcements. Uh, they're in the bulletin, but I'll mention uh, most of them. The altar flowers this morning are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Sister Marilyn Henry from Jim Henry and David and Karen Schaefer. Again, as it says in the bulletin, the devotionals or our daily bread devotionals for June, July, and August are now in the North X. Feel free to pick one up. And the events for the week ahead. Uh, last Sunday, we announced that there would be a consistory meeting last Monday, but at the last minute, it was moved. And that consistory meeting is now scheduled for Tuesday at 4. And again, they're always open for anybody who wants to attend. It's, they're here. But anyways, consistory meeting Tuesday at 4, Bible study Tuesday at 6 via Zoom, as we have been uh, for quite some time now. And then on Wednesday, uh, first of all, thank you, those of you who are involved with the soup kitchen uh, service, uh, doing um, St. Paul's piece there. But uh, on Wednesday, 10 a.m. is St. Paul's group's turn to uh, help there once again. So uh, 10 a.m. on Wednesday for the soup kitchen. And next week, we'll be back here once again for Bible study at 9.30 and worship at 10.45. Our call to worship this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 12. And Hebrews chapter 12 obviously comes on the heels of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, which you might remember is the great uh, chapter of faith, the heroes of the Old Testament and their faith, many of whom were stoned or sawn in two or killed by the sword, um, people of whom the world was not worthy as they held on to the promises of God, regardless of their temporary circumstances. So then we pick up with chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight of sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So let's pray. Father, for from you and through you and to you are all things. We pray, Lord, that this morning you would grant us the grace, pour out your spirit upon us, that we would walk in step with your spirit, invigorating us, Lord, to love and to serve and to glorify your name. And now pour your spirit out upon us, preparing our hearts and minds that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. With thankfulness, we bow and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our opening hymn is 363, To God Be the Glory. This was written by the prolific hymn writer Fanny Crosby, and it didn't get much traction, wasn't very popular, until it went to London and a Billy Graham crusade. And it was there that it took off, and then it came to the States, or became more popular in the States, so... 363, to God be the glory.
Okay, good morning. Our Old Testament reading this morning is Ecclesiastes in chapter 5. We're reading verses 10 to 20. <clears throat> so this morning, we're, looking, we're continuing to look at Matthew's Gospel and the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's teaching his disciples about what the kingdom looks like. Uh, and one of the things that we'll be looking at this morning is this idea of treasures, treasures, earthly treasures, heavenly treasures, and the such. So here in, in chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes, it talks about the uh, folly of riches, <clears throat> those who love money. But Ecclesiastes is part of the wisdom literature of the Bible, and um, so it's, it's an interesting challenge to us to understand what the writer is saying in terms of wisdom. But it is ultimately seeing things through uh, the lens of God's revelation. But hear the word as it comes to us from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, the words of Koaleth, the preacher. <clears throat> He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun. Riches being hoarded by their owner to, <coughs> to his hurt. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> when those riches were lost through a bad investment, and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? Throughout his life he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. Here is what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself in all one's labor, in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he, also, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. Here ends the reading of God's word. Okay, so let us, uh, as we continue here in worship, we will, now oh, I've lost my bulletin. We will... Uh, Recite the Apostles' Creed as a confession of our faith. It's number 137 in your hymnal. Let's uh, stand if willing and able to do that. <clears throat> Christian, what do, believe? what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And we come now to our time of, of prayer. It is uh, a prayer of confession of sin and the seeking of assurance of pardon from that sin. It's also intercessory. As is our practice, I'll give you a moment to pray silently, and then uh, I'll lead us in prayer. And we'll close together with what we call the Lord's Prayer. So let's do that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we continue in your grace and in worship of you, we come before you now as your people with hearts that are ready to confess our sin before you. You are holy, righteous, and good, and we are not. We have failed to love you as you call us to love you, to keep your word, to honor your name. And so we come and we ask, Lord, that you forgive us of the ways in which we have failed, knowing that you are merciful, that you are kind. You're not only holy and righteous and good, but your loving kindness is from everlasting to everlasting. And you hear the cries of your people. You are a father who cares, who loves, who sustains, who gives all that is needed. Help us to understand these things. And that when we fail, we don't run away, but we run too your gospel of grace, your throne of grace, where we may find our needs met, the need of forgiveness, the need of encouragement and strength, patience and wisdom, to know that we are loved by you, and that you are with us, that you will always be with us, that you hold us, and you rescue us from the evil one. <clears throat> Father, help us to understand and to know that you are God. You have made us, and not we ourselves, but we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. Help us to know that this is the assurance of our salvation, that we are yours, that you are faithful to your word, and that as we look upon the Christ who has come, lived, given his life a ransom, a sacrifice in substitute for us, and raised from the dead, that we might be welcomed in your presence. Give to us that assurance that we are yours and you are ours. Father, we pray for those today who are on our hearts and minds. And we ask that you would hear their cries that you would work in their lives to bring comfort, to bring healing, that they too might know they are yours 
and you are the God who cares, merciful and kind. We pray for Nancy and Jack and the struggles that Jack faces. We thank you for Nancy's ministry among us and her ability to do all that she does. We pray for Jack and healing. We pray, continue to pray for Ron, Elaine's husband, who grieves her loss and his family. We pray as well for the Granda family. We do think of Tony, who struggles with cancer, and Sandra's son. We lift him up to you. We thank you for his wonderful attitude, living day to day. We thank you for that. We pray for him that you would bring healing to his body and that through his mom he would hear maybe in a new way, maybe for the first time, the gospel of Christ. And we pray for Patty, Janet's niece, who is preparing for surgery, that you give her calm, that you would be with her. We continue to lift up the Foxhole's friend, Robert. And we think of Earl and Shirley. We pray for Earl's healing and Shirley's ability to continue to minister to him as he needs for strength, patience, wisdom, We pray for the Strobel family. We pray for Dave and Willa, June's friends. We pray for Barb, Gable, and her family. We ask that you bring relief to her and her pain. We lift up Joe and Linda, and we know of certain things taking place, and we ask that you would be with Linda and with Joe that the results of testing would show what needs done and it may be met. We pray for Susie and Kathy and Rosemary. We lift up Iris and her family. We continue to pray for June as he looks forward to a new place. We pray that it goes smoothly and that you would continue to work in his life, not only work in his life, but use him as your witness of grace and truth in the place in which he finds himself, that he may be fruitful in his ministry. We lift up Roy and Janice and Forrest and Elijah. We thank you for Gwen and her ministry in Sierra Leone and the way she is able to operate even from the states here. We thank you for her willingness to share her ministry. We continue to pray for those in our government who rule over us, who have that authority and only have it because of you. We ask, Father, that you would bless them, that you would draw them close to yourself, that they would be champions for your word and principle, for your covenant, that they would show mercy to the most vulnerable, that they would honor the family and marriage. We pray for our congregation, our outreach here. We thank you for the gifts you have given your people. And we pray that you continue to cause them to grow in love for you and their neighbors. We think not only of our congregation, but the other congregations in this place, in this city, that you have called. 
and that you give strength to, and that you send out. And we pray for them, for wisdom, for encouragement, that they too would grow in love and wisdom and number. Father, we thank you for these many things that you give to us. We thank you again for who you are as creator and sustainer of life, the redeemer, and how you have given your son. And so we pray the prayer that he taught his people and he teaches us, that great kingdom prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Him is number 495. It is well with my soul. This one has an interesting story behind it. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I'm going to leave David, David to write about this one because I'm sure he would enjoy doing that. So, uh, it is well with my soul.
Okay, it's time for the young people's message. Okay, young people. What is treasure? We're going to talk about treasure. What is treasure? What is treasure? Have you th ever thought about that? What is a, a treasure? Some, something that has value, maybe? A treasure? It, it may have a, a value that everyone recognizes, or maybe it just has value uh, for you that only you recognize. So it could be an objective value or a sentimental value, but a treasure is something that has value. Do you have a treasure? Do you have anything you would call a treasure? Are you pursuing a treasure? And so I would ask you when you think about that, what is your treasure? What is it that you value? Often when we talk about treasure though, it has to do with uh, a map and you're trying to find a hidden treasure, a hidden treasure. And uh, so have you ever thought about that? A hidden treasure, seeking a hidden treasure, you want to do that kind of thing with a treasure map, hunt for treasure to find it. But what if, what if it's different? What if this treasure is different? What if it is more of a, a treasure that reveals something rather than hides, you know, has been hidden? Uh, have you ever thought about that? The reverse of a trying to find a hidden treasure. It's that the treasure itself reveals something hidden. Have you ever thought about treasure in that way? In our text this morning, Jesus is talking about treasure. And he's talking about it to his disciples. He's talking about earthly treasure. He's talking about heavenly treasure. Uh, and this is just one part of our text, but it's the one I want you to listen to. And uh, you can listen to all of it. Listen to uh, the text itself and the message. And I'll ask you then, what is the secret? What is the hidden thing that treasure reveals? Specifically, your treasure. What does your treasure reveal? So I want you to listen to the text and the message. Let me know that afterwards. And then what would be the treat? Well, we are talking about treasure. And so we are going to bring in those golden coins again. Golden coins of chocolate. Uh, but also, I want to bring in the treasure uh, that satisfies, and so we'll include the Snickers as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you uh, for these young hearts and young minds. <clears throat> we pray for them. We pray that as they read your word, that they grow in it that they pick up on these things. These things that Jesus talks about are very real to us. They were real to those of his day. And although the centuries may separate us, <clears throat> there are things that speak to our own hearts as well. And so we pray for them in this as they read your word, that they discover things that will bring them closer to being who they are supposed to be according to God's design. That they grow in their love for God, for Christ, and for his people, your people. And so, Father, we pray that not only for them, but we pray it for each one of us. And we ask it to the glory of Jesus Christ. In his name, amen. Okay, our text this morning, Matthew 6. And we're picking up, we looked at the prayer last time, verses 9 to 13, and we didn't, we only mentioned verses 14 and 15, but we're going to pick up with 14 and 15. We're going to read from 14 through 24, 14 through 24. Now, some of these things will seem uh, different, uh, maybe not talking about the same thing, but I, I think they are talking about the same thing, a common theme, if you will. So we're going to look at that. <clears throat> but listen to each one as it comes. Starting in verse 14 through 24. Hear God's word. For if you forgive, and I'm reading again from the New American Standard, 
this time, it really is the, my copy of it. Last week, I read from a copy off the internet of a New American Standard, which was different from my translation. So uh, that's what happened last time, if you remember. But this week, I am reading from mine. It is the New American Standard. It is an updated New American Standard, if that makes sense to you. Uh, so if words are different, we'll talk about them. But again, it's always open to question. Verse 14, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Whenever you fast... Do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And then, if then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Here ends the reading of God's word. Okay. So I'm going to use an analogy here to start that I think is, I've used it before, but I, I find it still helpful, useful for grasping just what is going on. You may recall the Copernican Revolution. Have you ever heard of the Copernican Revolution? Well, it was a paradigm shift from the Ptolemaic model of the heavens, which described the cosmos as having Earth stationary at the center of the universe. Um, and that changed to the heliocentric model with the sun at the center of the solar system. That's a Copernican revolution. That's what took place, this paradigm shift. And I think what we have here as we continue in this Sermon on the Mount is Jesus has, he's going to Israel. I mean, he's teaching Israel, right? Even though he's in Galilee, he's teaching Israel and he's teaching them about a paradigm shift, something that is revolutionary. It's about the kingship, the reign of God, and viewing the world then through the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is challenging them on fundamental concepts, blessedness, righteousness, kingdom, reward, what the world values versus what the kingdom values. And he's talking again to Israel. This is where he's come. And these, if there's, as I said this morning, if there's anyone in the world at this time when Jesus comes who should know the will of God, who should understand who God is and actually be communicating who God is to the world, it's Israel. And Jesus has come to Israel. And this is something that is shocking to them. It's hard for them to grasp. It will be hard for the 12 to grasp. But this is the revolutionary nature, this paradigm shift that he is bringing. And so as we continue to look at this um, Sermon on the Mount here, uh, and what I've just said is true from what we looked at before and will be true as we continue with it. 
But Jesus here, in our text this morning, Jesus is calling his disciples to a resolute loyalty to God. This is the overarching theme and the thing I want you to get. Jesus is calling his disciples to a resolute loyalty to God and kingdom. And so let's look at how we see that, how this comes out. Let me explain. So our context, again, is Matthew's gospel. It is a gospel about fulfillment, the fulfillment of God's promises. Jesus has announced that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. His ministry of healing and this casting out of demons is demonstrating the very power of God, the reign of God, which has come. And it is about turning back the curse. Uh, Jesus calls four of the twelve. Right? He's only called four of the twelve. Uh, but nevertheless, he sees the crowds, he goes up on a hillside, and his disciples come to him. He opened his mouth, Matthew says, he opened his mouth and began to teach them. That is a phrase, as we talked about earlier, linked to divine revelation. He is giving them revelation, the revelation of God. Uh, the character traits of the kingdom, those who find themselves in a state of blessedness. Jesus is at the center of it all. He is the source of righteousness, both in position, what we might call a declarative or forensic nature, and in conduct. What Matthew is talking about is conduct, his behavior. This idea of righteousness, Jesus is at the center of it. If you're uh, persecuted for righteousness sake on account of him, you are in a blessed state. That's what the text tells us in chapter 5. So blessedness is a state of being and heavenly reward. We see heavenly reward along the way. It belongs to those who are persecuted because of Christ. Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament, bring the promises of God into reality, and he is that to which all that has come before is pointing. What has come before finds its greatest significance in pointing to the reality of Christ. And therefore, whoever keeps and teaches them these things that have come before, the, the Old Testament law and prophets, he shall be called great in the kingdom. That's the message. Jesus calls his disciples to a righteousness that exceeds the Jewish authorities. And from what they have heard, what the ancients were told, Jesus gives them examples of the righteousness that will enter the kingdom. A righteousness that starts on the inside, and it governs thoughts and words as well as acts and deeds. A righteousness to be practiced not for the glory of men, but of God. Not for the earthly reward, but the heavenly reward. Jesus uses three fundamental exercises then to contrast the hypocrite and the true disciple. We've looked at almsgiving and prayer. Last week we talked about that focused prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples. And then today we pick up with the closing comment that Jesus makes. For if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. This is a continuation from last week, and the whole of this teaching is intended as a unit. I know we've broken it up, but it's for the purpose of kind of showing the meaning behind this and how this all fits together and what Jesus is teaching his disciples. The grouping of the three fundamental exercises, all almsgiving, prayer, and fasting, then continues as we look at these verses. And so as we looked at the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, this believer's prayer as the early church uh, called it, forgiveness was the only petition. Forgiveness was the only petition that Jesus added further comment to. The sequence or order of this forgiveness um, I don't think is the, the uh, sticking point here. You see, if you forgive men, for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive, then your Father will not forgive. I'm not sure the sequence is as important as the aspect of reciprocity, this idea of a spirit of forgiveness, that you're willing to forgive others just as your Father in heaven 
is willing to forgive you. This is the uh, more important point of it, the emphasis to have a spirit of forgiveness. And so then that would conclude the prayer section, and then we move on to fasting. And whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance in order to be seen fasting by men. Much like the almsgiving uh, section and the prayer section, fasting follows a similar pattern. Do not do as the hypocrites do, but you fast so as to be seen by your Father who will repay. The hypocrites put on an outward appearance. In other words, it's almost as though they make themselves beyond recognition. They cover themselves with ash and uh, they, they look in very gloomy, unrecognizable form. And they do that because they want to be seen and recognized. It's quite interesting. Uh, I once had a, um, I remember attending a, a congregation where the pastor would wear long black robes. Um, you know, for every Sunday, he would have on the long, dark robes. And, and I'm not saying anything about the robe wearing. I'm just going to uh, relate an experience here. So I said to the pastor one time, why do you wear those long, dark robes every Sunday? And his answer caught me. He said, so that I don't stand out. And I'm thinking... <laughs> Okay, uh, but th this is kind of the idea. Uh, the hypocrites are, you know, they're putting this stuff on and they are unrecognizable only to be recognized for what they're doing in fasting. And Jesus is saying here, don't you be like that. When you fast, anoint and wash. These would be daily routines. This would be the, you know, it's like, hey, for us today. Take a shower and look like you usually do. Don't do anything different. And this is what Jesus is saying to them, that when you fast, let it be, you know, before your father, not before men. And so the description of the fasting disciple is to look as though nothing is going on. Anoint and wash that daily routine. And so do not change your outward appearance. Your father who sees in secret, secret will repay you. And so again, we have this contrast in earthly and heavenly reward. You see this idea of they have their reward in full. In other words, that's it. That's all they're getting. But the heavenly reward comes from your father. And so we have this contrast. And that's been going on now for most of chapter 6. We even saw, you know, where those who were blessed because they were persecuted on account of Jesus, their reward in heaven is great. So we even got a taste of reward there as well. Now we're coming to a section here where we're going to talk about this. This is, you know, it's not a surprise, I don't think, uh, as you move into this section where Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, we have this proverb, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we move into this aspect of treasures, treasures on earth, treasures in heaven. So up to this point, Jesus has been distinguishing between earthly rewards and heavenly rewards. And now, <clears throat> he says, do not lay up for yourselves. But I think there's a better rendering of this, which says, stop laying up for yourselves. Maybe your translation has that. Stop laying up for yourselves treasures uh, on earth. So it's more about, um, there's a change here. Uh, it's not like, do not do this, but stop doing this. So your behavior may have been this, now change to this. Treasures on earth consisted of possessions that would be stored 
in a house, not in a bank. One commentator says banks were probably embryonic at that point. But uh, we have in the scriptures, it talks about things that are stored in the house and, or in a safe place. But even so, those things were susceptible to moth eating and rust consuming or thieves breaking in through uh, the mud walls to steal. So this idea of moth and rust and thieves is uh, for earthly treasures really suggests, you know, they are temporary in nature. Heavenly treasures, though, are in no such danger. They are the best investment, if you will. They are not susceptible to ro- uh, moth and, and rust and, and thieves and so forth. The value of earthly treasure is uh, temporary, but the heavenly treasure is eternal. And so it is safe. It is eternally safe. Um, So this is not so much here now about financial advice as a continuation, I would see here, as the theme of loyalty to God, to Christ. Over the last many verses, Jesus has compared and contrasted the earthly reward with the heavenly reward, practicing righteousness, not for the glory of men, but of God, brings about the heavenly reward. How do I lay up treasures in heaven, and what does that treasure in heaven consist of? It's later that we will see Jesus talk about an inheritance of eternal life. In fact, in chapter 19, he's going to deal with this topic in a similar way when he talks to the rich young ruler. You perhaps remember that. When he talks to the rich young ruler, um, he tells this rich young ruler uh, that, yes, he has done what he said, but now go and sell all that you have and come and follow me. And what does the rich young ruler do but go away Sad, And there's a conversation that then takes place with the disciples themselves uh, about this treasure. And it's there that he explains perhaps the, the consistency of this treasure in heaven as an inheritance to eternal life. But then we have here, um, it is about a committed life to serving Christ. We have this proverb that comes at the end. So stop laying up treasures in heaven or on earth, but do lay up treasures in heaven. And then this proverb, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we will note here, as we do often in the Psalms, where we see a change in person, uh, whether it's plural or singular, here it does change. Treasure is singular, and we move to the second person singular, your treasure, your heart, It's not that the treasure here leads the heart. We might think of it that way. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's not that the treasure is leading the heart this way or that way, but it's that the heart's value system, which is hidden to the eye, is revealed by the treasure it keeps. So young people, this is the idea of what this treasure is revealing. It's the treasure that reveals the heart. Then we move to the lamp of the body. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? The word picture here is that of the eye functioning as a lamp to light the way forward for the body that follows it. The light and darkness metaphor is similar to that of John's use, right? The whole idea of light, good aligned with God, and then darkness, the absence of good, the absence of light, the absence perhaps of God. And that's what Matthew's doing here. If therefore your eye is clear, uh, many translations may have that word clear. And it's a funny word because The word rendered clear is haplous in the Greek, and it has the meaning simple or single, 
as in not complicated, not confused, or complex. If your eye is single in purpose, your body will be full of light. If your eye is evil, and that's the word bad there, paneros, then your body will be full of darkness. So it is um, then a curious conclusion. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, if therefore the light <laughs> that is in you is darkness, then how great is that darkness? Um, I think here perhaps it is your eye that is let the darkness in. And how great is that darkness? Perhaps a reference here to self-deception. Self-deception could be the worst kind of darkness. So, but yet here with this idea of the eye is clear, the eye is single, it's not, it's simple, it's not confused. It is a perspective perhaps on the loyalty to God, a single purpose loyalty to God. And then we come to the last part. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God. And my translation says wealth, but others may say mammon. Sim, same thing. Uh, really a, a personification, perhaps, of wealth or mammon. This last verse spells out clearly the single-minded commitment that Jesus is calling his disciples to live out. Mammon, again, is the personification of money, but it also has the idea not only of money, but of property or even livestock in the scriptures. Jesus is teaching his disciples here about allegiance to God alone. Uh, so again, the word picture is that of a slave. When we talk about masters, we're talking about ownership. Um, it's that kind of image that's called to mind. And so he is calling for allegiance to God as owner. That these things, whether it's property or money or livestock, these material possessions, you run the risk of conflating the two who is who gets what is it God or is it wealth? here Jesus is being very clear he's given the example of the treasure on earth the treasure in heaven and the eye and the lamp to the body and now here it is very clear that he's calling for allegiance to God a loyalty to God alone a few points of application we close Jesus continues to teach his disciples a new way of living, a new way of viewing the world. It is, <clears throat> sorry, a paradigm shift. <clears throat> sorry. Viewing the world and life through the lens of God's kingship, through Christ. He calls his disciples to a spirit of forgiveness, just as God forgives. Forgiveness opens the door to new relationship. He calls his disciples to fast in such a way as to not seek the glory of men, but of God, to be genuine in what they are doing, not hypocritical. He calls his disciples to a single purpose commitment of loyalty to God with both the heart and with the eye. After uh, the rich young ruler walks away from Jesus, I just wanna pick up on that conversation. You remember now, it's the four who were called and Peter was among them. But when that rich young ruler walks away from Jesus in chapter 19, the disciples say to him, who then can enter the kingdom of God, right? Um, Jesus uh, tells them that with God all things are possible. Peter then says, Peter responded to him and said, behold, we have left everything. We have left everything and followed you. I can't help but think that this is the outworking of what was taught here in this Sermon on the Mount. With this idea of treasure, with the eye, everything is focused on allegiance to Christ. Peter says, we have left everything and followed you. What then will be there for us? And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the renewal when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also 
shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms on account of my name will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and last first. Look, I want you to think about that. You know, Jesus is sitting there with his disciples, teaching them these things about the kingdom of God. And these disciples who are listening, they're not thinking about their 401k. They're not thinking about, you know, what they have in the bank or stuff like that. It is about everything. He is calling them away from father, mother, brother, sister, from all that makes up their life before them. He's saying that it is a commitment, full commitment to God and to him at the center of it. And then what Jesus is going to do after the Sermon on the Mount, after the rich young ruler, after Peter's question, Jesus lived out what he taught his disciples. He set his face toward Jerusalem. He was resolute, resolute in his mission. His resurrection testifies to the faithfulness and to the fact that his word and his promise are trustworthy. What he told them is true, and what he tells you and me is true. His life, his death, and his resurrection testify to that. He calls you as his disciple to that same resolute loyalty to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word to us. Thank you again for who you are, your mercy, your love for us, and how you meet our needs. Father, we pray that as we think upon these words, upon the teachings of Christ to his disciples, and we see how they lived themselves, pray, O Lord, that you place in our hearts a desire and a loyalty to live for you, to take all that we have, all that you have given us, and to govern that toward your kingdom, to serve your people, to live to the glory of your name. Father, we thank you again for these things. We pray this all to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, appropriately, our closing hymn is I Surrender All, number 408.
people of God receive the blessing that comes from our God. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in his presence and his glory, blameless with great joy, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen. Thank you for coming and have a blessed week.